Welcome everyone. As Stephanie said, I'm Carrie Cork, a senior staff attorney at the Public Health Law Center, and I'll be moderating today's webinar, Out of Flavor Updates on Flavor Ban Legislation and Litigation. Uh, just to note that we have applied for CLE credit for this webinar. The Public Health Law Center is a national nonprofit organization that supports and advances public health policy change at the local, state, tribal, and federal levels. Our main offices are located at William Mitchell College of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota. Our commercial tobacco control team is a multidisciplinary group of tobacco control attorneys and policy analysts. Next, please. The Public Health Law Center supports public health by providing free legal technical assistance to public health advocates, professionals, state and local health departments, boards of health, and other partners across the United States. We do this in several ways. We provide legal research, policy development, implementation, and defense, and a wealth of publications, which are all available on our website, publichealthlawcenter.org. We also provide trainings and webinars, such as this webinar. We don't represent clients in court, and we don't lobby. Finally, our organization is committed to the principle that good public health cannot be achieved without addressing health equity. Our mission is to advance social justice and to reduce health disparities in all the work that we do. Next, please. Presenters today are Jamie Long and Joelle Lester. Jamie Long is a staff attorney at the Public Health Law Center. He provides legal technical assistance on commercial tobacco control issues to public health professionals and advocates, legal professionals, and advocates throughout the United States. Uh, before joining the Public Health Law Center, Jamie worked in Congress as a Deputy Chief of Staff and a legislative aide, and he also worked as a litigation attorney. Our next speaker is Joelle Lester, who is a Director of Commercial Tobacco Control Programs at the Public Health Law Center and leads our team of over 18 public health attorneys and policy analysts who all work to support tobacco control policy change throughout the country. Next, please. So here's an overview of what our speakers will be covering today. Jamie will start us off by explaining briefly why flavored tobacco products are harmful and then describing the latest legislative actions, uh, including sales restrictions of flavored commercial tobacco products at federal, state, tribal and local levels. Then Joelle will talk about past legal challenges and current lawsuits that have arisen across the country. So we'll have a brief Q&A session at the end of this presentation. Please enter any questions you may have in the box at the bottom of the screen. And with that, I'm gonna turn the podium over to Jamie. Thank you so much, Carrie. Good to be with everybody today. So I thought it would be helpful to start out the discussion of flavors with an example. And so if you think back to when you were a kid uh, and picking a box of cereal from the grocery store aisle, uh, when you were going for that Cheerios box, did you want the regular plain old Cheerios or were you more interested in the honey nut variety, the very berry variety or chocolate Cheerios? Uh, probably you were attracted to one of the flavors. And that's because we know that flavors attract kids both in cereal and unfortunately in tobacco. We have seen a proliferation of uh, flavored tobacco um, and many different uh, types of products. And we know that for youth, over 80% of young people who use tobacco products report starting with a flavored product. We also know that when it comes to flavored tobacco products, they make it easier to become addicted and they make quitting more difficult. Flavored cigars, which are pictured on this slide, uh, have seen sales increase by nearly 50% since 2008, and they now comprise a majority of the cigar market. With e-cigarettes, we have seen a huge prolifer proliferation in youth usage, which has been driven by flavors, and this led in 2018 to the U.S. Surgeon General declaring youth vaping to be an epidemic. In the 2019 youth survey, uh, reported vaping within the last month were 
over one in four high school students and over one in 10 middle school students. We also know that uh, menthol flavor uh, prevents, presents real harms uh, and that those harms do not fall equally among different users. In fact, they're disproportionately used by racial and ethnic minority smokers, by LGBTQ smokers, uh, and by youth. 85% of black smokers use menthol versus only 29% of white smokers, and this disparity is largely responsible for the tobacco-related health disparities we see among these groups. Menthol cigarettes are also the source of addiction for nearly half of all teen smokers, and today, seven out of 10 African-American youth who smoke use menthol cigarettes. So with this uh, list of harms from flavored tobacco products in mind, what types of actions have we seen at the federal, uh, state, and local level? Well, at the federal level, in 2009, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act was passed, and this did take the important step of banning the sale of most flavored cigarettes. So think candy, fruit, or alcohol flavors. However, it exempted uh, menthol flavors, and it exempted flavored non-cigarette tobacco products, such as cigars, smokeless tobacco, hookahs, and e-cigarettes. Uh, this action, though, did have real benefits. Uh, there was a study published just last week in the Journal of Adolescent Health which found the federal flavor ban led to a 43% decline in smoking among youth ages 12 to 17 and a 27% decline among young adults ages 18 to 25. And the study authors concluded that additional flavor restrictions would have even more benefits for reducing youth uh, tobacco usage. The uh, Food and Drug Administration has taken limited, limited regulatory actions on flavored tobacco so far. In July 2017, the FDA announced that it would pursue a comprehensive flavored tobacco products plan, but so far it has not followed through. Uh, in January 2020, however, it did take action on e-cigarettes and prohibited the sales of certain flavored e-cigarettes, uh, particularly cartridges or pods. Uh, however, it did not apply to customizable products like tank or mod systems, which are very popular, and it did not apply to disposable systems it also exempted menthol flavors. So there is considerable room left for state action um, on e-cigarette flavors. They also did not uh, take action on flavored cigars. At the tribal level, there has been uh, significant steps taken by many tribal governments, including the ones that are listed here on this slide. And that has ranged from a complete ban on selling vaping products uh, to focusing on flavors for e-cigarettes. So now we're turning to uh, what state and local jurisdictions can do on flavors. And so one thing we know is that they can't set tobacco product standards. Under the Tobacco Control Act, the FDA has the power alone to regulate tobacco uh, product standards. But states can put sales restrictions on certain types of products, such as flavored tobacco products, um, since this is not creating a product standard. The tobacco industry has argued that this uh, resembles a product standard, but so far these arguments have been rejected by courts, which Joel will go into in more detail later. So for states and local governments that are setting a uh, tobacco flavored policy, what does a best practice policy look like? What would be comprehensive? Well, in our view, a best practice would have four uh, elements. First, it would be a jurisdiction-wide ban with no exceptions for any territory within the jurisdiction. Second, it would prohibit menthol flavors. Third, it would cover all tobacco products. And fourth, there would be no exemptions for retailers such as hookah or tobacco bars, retail tobacco stores, or adult-only shops. We've developed a model definition of a flavored tobacco product, um, and this takes the approach that uh, the best practice to regulate uh, flavored tobacco products is to do so based on a characterizing flavor or smell. This is because uh, testing for actual flavoring may be difficult or prohibitively expensive for particular jurisdictions. And relying on advertising or statements uh, is also tricky. Uh, for one thing, descriptions such as mellow or arctic may not refer to a flavor, but uh, they often can imply a flavor without using explicit descriptions. This is also true for so-called concept flavors such as jazz, where there's no description of a flavor at all, but there still may be a distinguishable taste or smell. So that's why our definition covers any tobacco product 
with a taste or smell distinguishable by an ordinary consumer. And as you can see, we also include uh, menthol or mint as flavors. So what actions have states taken so far? Well, in 2019, you'll recall, the Evoli crisis was hitting hard. Uh, the e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury. And this led to 2,800 hospitalizations and 68 deaths, according to the CDC. And as you can see on the map, those were spread out uh, across the country. There's also been recent announcements of deaths and injuries from Avali uh, returning with uh, some stories as recent as last week. So eight states in 2019 uh, took action in response to the, this concern over vaping deaths. And those were the states listed there. Those were temporary bans on e-cigarette flavors, although some of these states have gone on to make uh, these bans permanent. And the state that's gone the farthest to date is Massachusetts, which uh, was the first mover and passed its law in November of 2019, going into effect this past June. And their law limits the sale of flavored cigarette and tobacco products. They include menthol and e-cigarettes, but they do have uh, the ability to still sell flavored tobacco products for on-site consumption in licensed smoking bars. So these include uh, cigar bars or hookah bars as examples. Uh, before the law went into effect this past June, uh, convenience stores asked the state to delay it, uh, the implementation due to COVID-19, but their request was not granted. And so the law has uh, now taken effect. There have also been actions uh, in a number of states specific to flavored e-cigarettes. Uh, Maryland took action in February uh, 2020. So this goes beyond the um, FDA limits by also including tanker mod systems uh, and disposable e-cigarettes. Um, the Maryland action did in, uh, continue the menthol exemption, however. Rhode Island, New Jersey, and New York have also uh, acted uh, to cover both additional e-cigarette products. And then those three states also include uh, menthol flavoring. Uh, Utah is the most recent actor uh, just this month. Um, they exempt menthol and they also allow specialty tobacco shop sales. For uh, three of these states, these actions were taken administratively, those states being Maryland, Rhode Island, and Utah. Uh, and in New Jersey and New York, these actions were taken by statute. Um, one other uh, state that was an early mover in acting on flavored tobacco products was Maine. Uh, which banned flavored cigar sales way back in 2009 uh, with an exemption for premier cigars. Some states have uh, proposed action and have action in the, in the works. California uh, has a bill, SB 793, which is currently working its way through the California legislature. And this would be a statewide uh, flavor ban. It uh, passed the Senate just last month, 33 to 4. Uh, it does include an exemption for hookah and shisha if uh, the a store is licensed to sell tobacco products, if they don't permit uh, anyone under 21, and if they comply with other rules for tobacco retailers. The California Assembly uh, currently has uh, the bill, and the Committee on Health has scheduled a hearing for next week, August 4th, so stay tuned. Montana is pursuing action at the administrative level. So they would join the other uh, five states that have taken action perhaps on eliminating uh, sale of flavored e-cigarettes, and they have cited the epidemic of youth e-cigarette product use in Montana. So that brings us to uh, local jurisdictions. And so far, cities in nine states have enacted flavor bans. Providence, Rhode Island was the first mover passing its ordinance in 2012. And now it is up to over 270 total localities around the country according to a very helpful list maintained by the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kit. And the most active states so far are Massachusetts with 168 localities, California with 77 localities, and Minnesota with 12 localities. And these include a number of big cities uh, that have also taken action. So just as a reminder what a comprehensive policy looks like, uh, it would include these four best practices in our view. And there are a number of trophy cities that have achieved this, including Oakland, Sacramento, and San Francisco in California, St. Louis Park in Minnesota. And there are nearly 20 mid-sized and large cities that have uh, comprehensive policies. We're also going to walk through what a number of jurisdictions uh, have chosen to do on each of these four uh, areas for best practices, 
give you an example of what the best practice would be and what some jurisdictions uh, have decided to pursue. So first would be uh, whether or not the ban is jurisdiction-wide. Uh, Minneapolis is a good example of a best practice where they say very clearly that within their jurisdiction, no person sell, shall sell or give away uh, flavored tobacco products or samples. Another approach is the one taken by Chicago and some other cities where they limit their restrictions to a specific buffer zone. In Chicago's case, the flavored tobacco sale restriction only applies within 500 feet of the property line of a secondary school. Second issue is whether or not menthol is prohibited. Uh, Jersey City, New Jersey is a best practice where their definition of flavored tobacco product covers any tobacco product that contains a taste or smell other than the taste or smell of tobacco. So clearly this includes mint and menthol. Um, New York City, on the other hand, uh, exempts menthol tobacco products, although as of July 1st, they do include uh, menthol flavored e-cigarettes uh, in their uh, ban. The third question is whether they cover all tobacco products. Uh, Massachusetts is an example of a best product, best practice, where they include uh, cigarettes, cigars and little cigars, chewing tobacco, pipe tobacco, snuff, e-cigarettes, and electronic cigars. Some jurisdictions, though, have chosen to focus only on e-cigarettes, and those include uh, places like Boulder, Colorado, Jersey City, New Jersey, and Yonkers, New York. Uh, this brings us to the fourth um, issue, which is whether or not there are retailer exemptions that are included in the uh, tobacco bans. And these can come in uh, a number of different varieties. So one would be defining uh, retail tobacco stores to be exempt. And Chicago, Illinois looks to whether or not uh, a store derives over 80% of its revenue from the sale of tobacco products to create its exemption. Lowell, Massachusetts looks to whether their primary purpose uh, is to sell tobacco products. Second type of retail exemption is for adult only shops. Boston, Massachusetts says uh, that uh, their restriction does not apply to adult only retail tobacco stores. In Philadelphia, they look to whether uh, any store is an adult-only establishment uh, to create their exemption. Tobacco and smoking bars are a third type of retailer exemption. In uh, Providence, Rhode Island, they allow smoking uh, of flavored tobacco in a smoking bar, and they define that as being primarily devoted to serving tobacco products for on-site consumption with annual tobacco sales revenue over 50% and where serving of food or alcohol is incidental. New York City also exempts tobacco bars, and as mentioned, uh, Massachusetts exempts smoking bars. A fourth type of retailer exemption is uh, hookah. Uh, Burbank, California is one example where they exempt uh, hookah tobacco unless it is an electric hookah pipe or water pipe, and South San Francisco also exempts uh, hookah tobacco. We uh, have a publication coming out very shortly regarding the harms of hookah and the importance of not exempting hookah. Uh, we know that hookah may pose a greater risk to human, human health than other commercial combustible tobacco products. And hookah is also often targeted at youth and it uh, is in fact more prevalent uh, for usage among youth of color. That brings us to enforcement. Even if you have um, the uh, perfect policy you're going to be to make sure uh, to have strong enforcement to make sure that uh, it is effective. And here are a few uh, criteria that we think make for good enforcement. The first is not including purchase use or possession penalties, often called PUP penalties. We know that nicotine is highly addictive and penalizing youth use shifts the burden to the youth when the tobacco industry has intentionally campaigned to hook them. We should instead focus penalties on the industry and focus our cessation efforts on uh, tobacco product users. Also, PUP laws are harder to enforce. There are many more potential enforcement targets, for one thing, and there are also equity concerns uh, with enforcement, depending on where and how you are targeting enforcement resources. Uh, it is much more effective and easier to target the retail side with compliance checks. The second uh, best practice for enforcement is having retailer education, making sure that as a law is being rolled out, that all retailers are aware of uh, the, uh, the new restrictions that are coming into place. And compliance checks are really the gold standard for enforcement. 
There have been evaluations of various programs using compliance checks in Minneapolis and St. Paul, in New York City, and in Massachusetts. And they have all shown that compliance checks are very effective at reducing the sales of flavored products. Uh, it's important to note that you want sufficient resources to regularly check compliance. Um, our model ordinance recommends at least three compliance checks per store per year, and at least one time per year with an underage decoy. An example of a success story is Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, a study in 2019 of Providence's enforcement found that their compliance checks were effective at both increasing compliance and at reducing youth usage of tobacco products. There was also another recent study that found that from 2015 to 2016, Rhode Island was the only state in the country to see a significant decline in flavored e-cigarette sales uh, due to Providence's uh, enforcement. Uh, on the other hand, the study also found that because Providence had a menthol exemption, uh, Rhode Island had the second highest rate of menthol sales in the country at 44%, uh, showing some of the pitfalls of exemptions. Uh, one other exemption pitfall uh, is the uh, retailer exceptions. Uh, which often make enforcement a lot harder. And uh, the example I'll use today is uh, Duluth, Minnesota, where they passed an ordinance that limited flavored tobacco sales to adult-only smoke shops, which they defined as retail establishments that prohibited minors from entering and that derived at least 90% of their revenue from the sale of tobacco or tobacco-related devices. So this would have excluded convenience stores, um, but within a year, multiple convenience stores in Duluth took advantage of the exemption um, to renovate portions of their retail spaces and apply to have those uh, be smoke shops with separate entrances and separate employees. And that um, obviously frustrated the purpose of the original ordinance and uh, earned the headline that you see here, Duluth businesses circumvent flavored tobacco pin. So if you don't want a headline like this in your jurisdiction, uh, then best not to have uh, retailer exemptions that folks can uh, use to get around. Um, and with that, just want to draw your attention to some of the publications that the Public Health Law Center has available, including U.S. sales restrictions on flavored tobacco products, which goes into some detail about some of the jurisdictions that we talked about today. And this is current as of April 2020. And also regulating flavored tobacco products, which uh, has some more information and suggestions uh, for jurisdictions that want to pursue flavored tobacco product regulation. We also have, uh, with our partnership with the American Lung Association of California, a comprehensive tobacco retail licensing ordinance that includes model language on uh, flavored tobacco restrictions. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Joelle to talk about litigation. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to um, revisit several of the topics that Jamie has raised about how to structure an effective flavored tobacco product sales restriction from the perspective of the litigation challenges that often follow. Um, so I, I think if you've worked in tobacco control for um, very long, you are aware that the tobacco industry is pretty litigious. So it's helpful to understand the authority of your community or your state to act and how to best structure a policy um, based on that authority to protect health in your community. So Jamie had mentioned the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act of 2009. And just as a refresher, that was the um, law that gave the FDA uh, the authority to regulate tobacco products. And as you recall, initially, the law only applied to the four um, categories of tobacco products that you see here and allow the FDA to deem all other tobacco products subject to its jurisdiction, which it did eventually in 2016. The Tobacco Control Act included sort of a set of provisions that divvied up responsibility and authority for different parts of tobacco product regulation between the federal government, the FDA, and states and locals where there isn't a restriction on local authority in that state. And so this is really important because this piece of the law ends up being sort of the crux of a lot of tobacco industry challenges to all kinds of um, tobacco control policies at the state and local level, but certainly those that restrict the sale of flavored tobacco products. So you'll see that there's three clauses um, that relate to who can do what, a preservation clause, um, which 
largely pr preserves state and local authority over pieces of tobacco product regulation, a preemption clause, which sort of preserves some of it for the FDA, and then a savings clause, which is supposed to mean if it's unclear, um, it, those things are reserved to the states and locals. So to show you how that shakes out outside of how the provisions are actually written, um, the FDA retains almost total authority um, to establish tobacco product standards. So things like limiting the level of nicotine in tobacco products to minimally addictive or subaddictive levels, that's something that the FDA can do. Um, restricting ingredients or constituents such as flavor additives is something the FDA can do. And then um, regulating how they're constructed. There is, um, there may be a tiny bit of authority for states and locals to do some of that, but for the purposes of this conversation, we'll just say that that's an authority that's reserved to the FDA. The FDA can also um, establish sales restrictions and regulate advertising and marketing, but does not have the authority to establish smoke-free laws, um, to tax tobacco products, or to ban a whole class of products. So for example, banning the sale or banning all um, cigars wouldn't be allowed. Um, states and locals, as I said, have um, limited, if any, authority to do tobacco product standards, but they have all authority to do smoke-free um, places. Um, they have authority over use access, taxes and pricing, um, sales and distribution, and some advertising and promotion. Although, as you know, there's a big asterisk there because of the First Amendment. So that's always a tricky barrier um, for any kind of advertising and promotion regulation. So um, because the authority is pretty clear on sales restrictions, and it's that's one way to get these pernicious flavored products off the market. Um, many jurisdictions have, have taken that action. Jamie gave us a good overview of the variations on the theme that we've seen around the country. And um, these from New York and Providence on the left over to San Francisco on the right, we've seen sort of how the um, communities have grown in their understanding of how to use this policy to best protect health and their confidence that the courts were going to uphold um, their authority to do so. So New York City and Providence were the early, um, the early cities to proceed with flavored tobacco product restrictions with um, exemptions, as Jamie already explained, um, including menthol, which is a, a major exemption. It's a huge gap in um, the federal law. Um, when, when the um, Tobacco Control Act was passed and restricted the um, flavored cigarettes, it exempted menthol menthol, which is a big problem because they're the most commonly used in drive health disparities. So when the city of Chicago passed its flavor ordinance and included menthol, that was um, a really big deal. And then as Jamie said, it got more comprehensive with examples like San Francisco. So those cities have also been um, leaders in helping us understand how the litigation is going to play out. Um, so I'm going to talk through sort of each of these cases that you see up here. San Francisco is actually not a lawsuit, but I'll explain that in a second. And then we'll talk about some lawsuits that are pending right now over flavored tobacco product restrictions. So the New York City and Providence, Rhode Island cases both involved ordinances that exempted a certain kind of retailer. They were pretty narrow exemptions in both of those cases. Both the jurisdictions were sued in federal court and one at the district court level and on appeal at the circuit court level. In both cases, the courts found that the sales restrictions were just that. They were sales restrictions, which is an authority preserved under the Tobacco Control Act, and they were not a tobacco product standard in disguise, which is what the industry was arguing. A few years later, when Chicago passed the first ever menthol inclusive flavored tobacco product sales restriction, they also were sued. So this was really important because um, the Tobacco Control Act treated menthol a little differently. And so the tobacco industry tried to make the argument that that different treatment in the law meant that it should be um, preempted and that now this was a tobacco product standard in disguise and the court disagreed. Um, as you can see from the language here, finding that the ordinance was, was clearly within the authority of the states and locals. Um, another sort of litigation challenge is a slightly different one. It's not about federal preemption, is one that's been happening in Massachusetts towns. Cumberland Farms is the plaintiff in multiple cases, um, and they have been challenging how the flavored tobacco product sales restriction is implemented and enforced. And so, um, as Jamie indicated earlier, um, it can be tricky to identify exactly which products are considered flavored tobacco products because the states and locals need to stay within their authority under the Tobacco Control Act. 
they don't have great information from the FDA about which products are flavored products. Um, and so they have to figure out sort of systematic protocols to reliably identify the products. Um, and the way that this was happening in Massachusetts was taking information from multiple sources to make a list of all the flavored products that were um, prohibited for sale in the communities. And in Yarmouth, Massachusetts is the, the case that was decided that I'm referring to here. The um, Cumberland Farms was saying that just being able to tell by smell that it's flavored is arbitrary and capricious and that that wasn't a good system. And the, the court upheld the Yarmouth Board of Health's approach, um, finding that um, that's a perfectly reasonable way um, to identify uh, flavored tobacco products. So this one's interesting too, because what we see is the industry sometimes argues that um, if you get into ingredients and constituents, that's too much like a tobacco product standard, but then they also say if you aren't identifying the smell based on what's in the tobacco product, then they don't agree with that enforcement process either. So it's really important that the court upheld the process used in Yarmouth, um, and the same process is used by many communities in Massachusetts with flavored tobacco product restrictions. So San Francisco is an interesting case because when San Francisco passed their flavored tobacco product restriction, um, it was the first totally comprehensive policy. So it didn't exempt any flavor, any kind of uh, tobacco product in any retailer. It's a total prohibition on the sales within the city. And um, those of us who are watching this kind of policy change with great interest thought that the industry would sue. Um, and instead, RJ Reynolds funded a ballot re measure repeal effort to try to take down um, the ordinance that way. And um, it was, they outspent the public health advocates dramatically, um, and yet voters upheld the ordinance, which was really exciting. Um, so there actually has not been litigation filed against San Francisco so far um, over that ordinance. So now we'll turn to the current cases. And um, it's very interesting, um, and I think a sign of the industry's uh, concern about the pace of policy change in this area and also a sign of um, how important flavors are to their business model, especially menthol, that suddenly we're seeing a rash of cases around the country trying to, um, to have uh, ordinances restricting the sale of flavored tobacco products struck down. So the first two cases we'll talk about are both against the county of Los Angeles. Um, Los Angeles County adopted a strong flavored tobacco product sales restriction and um, met with two challenges, one from the California Smoke and Vape Association, and then a little while later, RJ Reynolds got in on the game and also sued the county. And so these two lawsuits both challenged the ordinance based on federal preemption um, questions. So just exactly what we talked about a few minutes ago with the authority under the Tobacco Control Act to act at the state and local level, the um, plaintiffs in these cases are saying, um, no, the, only the FDA can regulate flavors and that's expressly in the Tobacco Control Act and also is implied. Um, and then in both cases, the plaintiffs moved for a preliminary injunction, which as you probably know, just means that the um, county wouldn't be able to implement and enforce the ordinance until the litigation is resolved. And the judge rejected that. Um, saying that they haven't demonstrated serious questions going to or a likelihood of success on the merits of their preemption claim, which was an excellent result um, from that federal judge. Um, both of those plaintiffs are aggressively moving forward and uh, have made motions for summary judgment as well. <clears throat> there are two other cases against California jurisdictions, one against the city of Palmdale and another against the county of San Diego. So these are a little different. They're not comprehensive um, flavored tobacco product sales restrictions. They are more limited. So you can see that Palmdale prohibits the sale of flavored e-cigarettes. Um, interestingly, they include the flavor of tobacco in their flavor restriction, which um, makes sense when you think about the fact that e-cigarettes aren't naturally tobacco flavored. Um, but um, not a lot of communities have taken that approach. And then they also include menthol. And the, the Vape Association, you'll notice, this is the same plaintiff as one of the cases against um, LA County. And they, again, are relying on federal preemption claims. The lawsuit against the County of San Diego is over their policy restricting the sale of tobacco products except for hookah. Um, and they have a pause on e-cigarette sales, but it's treated differently. Um, and it's sort of a pause for study. 
Um, and again, um, the plaintiff here relies on federal preemption under the Tobacco uh, Control Act. Um, the law firm in both of the California Smoke and Vape Association cases and the Neighborhood Market Association is the same law firm. So that's also kind of interesting to see um, that there's something of a concerted approach. In addition to the California cases, um, there are a couple in Minnesota, which is where I'm sitting right now. Um, as Jamie said, California, Minnesota, and Massachusetts have been particular um, um, hotspots for policy change in this area with communities um, moving more and more quickly to take action to protect health and youth from flavored tobacco products. And um, in the town of Arden Hills, Minnesota, a uh, tobacco retailer sued over the city's policy that eliminates the sale of all flavored tobacco products. So like San Francisco, this one doesn't exempt any retailer, any flavor, or any product. Um, the retailer filed suit in state court um, and argues a, a number of things, preemption, equal protection, vagueness, and those sorts of things. Um, and then um, more recently, R.J. Reynolds, um, came and sued the city of Edina, which is um, also in the metro area of um, Minneapolis and St. Paul. And um, the lawsuit was filed very quickly after uh, the city council passed a policy to also eliminate the sale of all flavored tobacco products, no exemptions. The arguments are similar to the RJ Reynolds case against LA County um, and, and focus on federal preemption of the ordinance. And then there's one more, um, making it seven cases right now, the Cigar Association of America and several other big um, plaintiffs like Swedish Match and Swisher Sweets have sued the city of Philadelphia. Um, this one is um, a flavor restriction with exemption for certain retailers. And the complaint was filed in federal, or I'm sorry, in state court and on state claims, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but the city filed a motion to remove to federal court. Um, and the, the, in addition to the state preemption, they also argue due process violations and vagueness. So I want to point out a couple of things about all of these cases, actually the ones that have been resolved and these, is that they vary quite a bit in what is included in the policy. And sometimes exemptions can um, create an opening for litigation or an additional cause of action. And so exemptions not only um, reduce the public health benefit of a policy like this, but they can also complicate implementation and enforcement, and they can um, raise new problems in litigation if the underlying rationale for the exemption isn't related to the public health goals of the policy. Um, and it doesn't necessarily, as you can see, help you even avoid litigation because the industry is very motivated to keep flavored products on the market and um, has fought all kinds of restrictions. So a, a couple of key takeaways in addition to that, the, the industry is so deeply concerned about flavor policy momentum that we have seen them um, threaten litigation. So they, they're well aware that litigation is um, a way not only to overturn um, an ordinance, but also to chill policy change because many communities are very worried and reluctant to engage in litigation and, and um, will be more cautious about adopting strong commercial tobacco control policies if they fear that the industry is going to sue them. And so this um, little um, picture on the right is of a letter from Jones Day, which is the um, big law firm that represents R.J. Reynolds, um, sent to the Marion Board of Health in Marion, Massachusetts, um, when, when that community was considering um, a menthol-inclusive flavored tobacco product restriction all the way back in 2016, sort of laying out legal arguments and threatening to sue. Fun fact, the signatory on this letter is um, Noel Francisco. He had been at Jones Day and then he left and served as a U.S. Solicitor General and now he's leaving that post as the, the government's top lawyer and he's going back to Jones Day. So perhaps we will um, hear from him again in communities around the country. Um, but the, the really important takeaway is that in every lawsuit based on federal preemption against the flavored tobacco product ordinances around the country, the court has upheld the sales restriction. So the increase in litigation that we're seeing in the last few months is not a reflection of a new legal theory or a change in the law. And the increased resources that the industry is sinking into its litigation strategy should not distract us from what we know to be true, which is that 
um, the plain language of the act provides authority for sales restrictions to states and locals. And in those communities that have passed all kinds of these sales restrictions and been sued um, based on federal preemption, the, the ordinance has been upheld. So um, I just say that to reassure um, because I think it can be really stressful to feel, to be threatened with litigation or to actually engage in litigation and, um, and just know that it's a particular tactic from the industry. It, it doesn't reflect a change in the law or in authority. Um, so most of the litigation we have talked about so far is um, uh, the communities who are trying to protect health are on defense. Um, but there's actually been a lawsuit filed now where public health organizations are seeking to advance um, public health protections through litigation. Um, this isn't the only suit of its kind, but I'm bringing this one up because it is um, focused on menthol um, tobacco products. So including cigarettes and closing that gap in the original flavor restriction at the federal level and, um, and pushing the FDA to act. So as Jamie mentioned, the FDA hasn't done anything to close that gap since the law passed in 2009, despite collecting a lot of information. I should amend that. It's not that they have done nothing, it's that they have collected a lot of information um, and they have been petitioned by public health groups to act and they have not uh, promulgated a tobacco product standard to prohibit menthol and cigarettes and other tobacco products. So in June, um, the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, together with Action on Smoking and Health, uh, filed a lawsuit against the FDA um, seeking to uh, force the agency to act um, in accordance with the public health standard in the law and other provisions in the law that require the agency to uh, review and reflect on um, regulations and um, do its uh, regulatory actions based on the information and science that they have. So that's, um, it, I think it's a really different way of looking at litigation for folks in public health, but it's useful to be open to it. Um, and there are other organizations who have been real leaders in this way, the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, American Academy of Pediatrics, Heart Association, Lung Association, ACS CAN. Um, they have filed a couple of lawsuits also pushing the FDA to use its pre-market review authority more effectively and appropriately and to um, pr uh, promulgate the graphic health warning regulation that was long overdue. And I think that um, part of this sort of sh shift in thinking about litigation is we're so accustomed to being um, on the defense with it, but in tobacco control, litigation maybe should just be part of our um, long-term policy change thinking, um, either defending the excellent ordinances that communities are passing or in pushing um, the government agency with authority um, to act to best protect public health. Um, so we congratulate Ash and AATCLC on that important move. Um, so for flavor policies, the, the takeaways aside from the, um, all the cases that have been resolved on federal preemption grounds have upheld the ordinance is that you do want to um, carefully draft the ordinance and um, to stay on that strong legal ground. And uh, the focus should be using the authority to restrict sales. Um, we are happy to help you. We provide individualized legal technical assistance to communities all around the country to help with policy development, to examine how the policy should best fit within the um, city code that you're operating. Um, we also have, um, we track all of this litigation and we're happy to give information about these cases as they unfold. Um, and any other questions that you have, you can always, always contact us. I do want to mention that we've added a section um, on our FDA tobacco project page um, where we track all of these cases, a whole bunch of cases, but these as well. You can see the lawsuits related to federal preemption there in the bottom left, and there's a drop down menu, and there's little case summaries for all of these cases. So we're trying to make it easy for you all to keep track of what's happening in these jurisdictions, and also to get a sense of whether or not the outcome in a particular case um, is relevant to what you have authority to do in your jurisdiction. Um, so that's a good place to look. That's on our website at publichealthlawcenter.org. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up and we are happy to take questions, um, both Jamie and me. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Carrie Cork to moderate the Q&A portion.
Thank you both, uh, Joelle and Jamie, for these very informative presentations. Uh, we have received a few questions, and I want to encourage folks to enter any questions they may have now in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Okay, the first question we have, and um, I think I'll ask Jamie, but Joelle, please chime in if you'd like. Um, how are states handling tobacco sales compliance checks with youth decoys during COVID? Uh, the, uh, we plan to resume in October 2020. I'm looking for safety guidance and advice around this matter. So that's a, a very good question. Um, I know that the FDA had uh, suspended compliance checks or put them on hold. I, I believe that's still the case, although I'm not sure if um, they made any recent announcements that, that we might have missed. And um, so I think that's uh, an important question um, I don't know that there's um, been a, a trend that we've seen of restarting at this point. Um, and I think I would certainly recommend working with uh, state health departments and others on best practices for uh, resuming any, any sort of in-person compliance checks. Joelle, I don't know if you have anything you'd want to add. I think that's, that's exactly right, Jamie. I would just add that there's sort of a companion challenge here too, I think, with many um, health department staff members being sort of reassigned to the emergency response. So there's fewer resources in place to be thinking through these really tricky issues of protecting health and safety of the folks doing the compliance check. So um, I don't know that anyone has figured out a set of best practices yet, um, but I think folks around the country who are similarly situated are working really hard in that right now, sort of with the confines, within the confines of the limited resources available. Okay, thank you, uh, both of you. Um, we did receive another question. Um, why, this Joelle, maybe you can take this. It's why is the flavored tobacco litigation discussed held in federal court as opposed to state court? Um, actually, um, two of the current cases were filed in state court. The one against the city of Philadelphia, which now has been removed to federal court by the city. Um, but then also the one against Arden Hills, Minnesota was filed in state court. And usually that has to do with who the parties are and which, what claims they're making. And so, you know, the um, preemption claims in the Philadelphia case were based on state uh, law, not the federal law. Um, so that, that has to do with it and also where the plaintiffs are located and, and the kinds of arguments that they're making. Um, but it is interesting. I think it's, 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 relates to the industry strategy at the national level to file it in federal court and in different parts of the country um, to try to um, sort of find a spot where there's someone more receptive to their arguments perhaps. Um, but they've been very persistent considering um, how many courts have already upheld um, the authority to act like this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jamie, uh, we received a question. What is the pace of change we're seeing in new flavor policies? Well, it's been very fast. Um, we had our publication come out uh, in April, uh, compiling all of the different changes. And um, there have been many since then, uh, just in the last few months, uh, both at the state level and the local level, it seems like uh, there is a local jurisdiction almost every single week that is uh, passing a new ordinance um, and uh, went over some of the, the state actions that are uh, in the works right now. So I think this is an exciting time uh, for uh, flavor restrictions being enacted um, across the country. And I think as Joelle mentioned, um, that pace is probably what's uh, concerning the industry and uh, leading to some of these, these challenges is that they um, are seeing uh, the success of uh, um, having these flavor policies enacted and uh, the real limitations that that puts on youth usage. Can I add one thing to that too? I think the evolution of the policy change in flavors has really echoed what we've seen in other areas of tobacco control, which is the locals lead the way. And that it really, even though states have had the authority to act, it was after years of um, leaders like New York City, Providence, Rhode Island, Chicago, many, many communities now in California before we had Massachusetts um, break new ground with state legislation. And so 
I think that um, for us, it's always so exciting to see the, the courage and leadership coming from the local level because that um, generates this kind of momentum that can lead to broader policy change. And we hope that goes all the way up to FDA regulation. Great, thank you. Okay, um, Jamie, perhaps you could take this one. Um, could you speak more to the reason to focus on sales restrictions when it comes to flavored tobacco products instead of advertising, at least in the US context? Sure, well, I think we, there's a lot of evidence that sales restrictions are very effective at reducing youth tobacco usage um, for flavored products. And I, I mentioned a few of the studies that have uh, talked about the success that uh, local jurisdictions have had in uh, reducing um, reducing flavored uh, tobacco usage and, and in particular youth usage. Uh, advertising restrictions are certainly another option and that's something that we talk about in our publication on uh, flavored tobacco restrictions. Uh, as Joelle mentioned, advertising does uh, have its own unique um, issues around a First Amendment that you have to be careful with and cognizant of. Uh, but I think if you're just doing a straight pound for pound, which is more effective, uh, sales restrictions are going to be uh, more bang for your buck in terms of uh, reducing youth usage. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with everything Jamie said. And I would also just add that one of the main mechanisms for exposure to the advertising and marketing is the packaging itself. And so getting those products off the shelves, I mean, Jamie, you illustrated this point with the different boxes of Cheerios and the flavors, you know, just getting all of those out of convenience stores itself reduces exposure to um, by of young people to these um, messages and images. So it, the sales restriction carries some of the benefits of the advertising or marketing restriction. Great. Okay, uh, Joelle, uh, why don't, um, how is the federal government implementing its policy uh, or is it still in progress? Well, um, as Jamie indicated in his remarks, it's been um, maybe it's more of a series of announcements. I would say it's been a series of information gathering sessions and um, announcements of intentions to do some restrictions but not an actual regulatory scheme um, being put into place. And so there is a guidance out about flavored products, but um, as Jamie explained, that focuses on flavored e-cigarettes. It doesn't include all flavors and it doesn't include all e-cigarettes and it's only temporary. Um, the, once the products go through pre-market review, the restriction wouldn't be in place. So I would say um, that's an underwhelming response to an overwhelming problem. The FDA has much greater authority to act comprehensively to get these products off the market, but until they do, it's up to the states and locals to protect health in their communities. Thank you. Um, Janie, uh, this uh, question is for you. I was under the impression that once per year for compliance checks was sufficient, even determined to be the minimum best um, and level. Please let me know how you determine the best practices for compliance monitoring with three checks per retailer per year. Sure, I, I might uh, defer to Joelle on this one since she was, I think, more involved with uh, developing this policy. Yeah, this was um, something that we worked on in conjunction with partner organizations. Um, and what we heard from the field was that once a year was insufficient to um, have the desired effect of increasing compliance. So it's, you know, it's important to catch the violators, but it's even more important to promote compliance and avoid the violations in the first place. And mo more frequent compliance checks um, advances that goal. I will say, we understand that this is also a resource question for communities and how um, you fund the compliance checks. It's its, its own consideration. And so um, we, we think that three is the best practice, but understand that some communities are, aren't able to do that at this time, which is maybe a reason to consider increasing your licensing fee, but that's another webinar. Okay, I'm gonna throw this open to either of you. It's, uh, it's a question related to how do you handle issues around prohibiting transfer of ownership when a store is within, um, say, 500 feet of schools and grandfathered in with the current owner? 
um, we have language that we could provide to um, help you accomplish that goal if you want in your um, your ordinance. And there are there are communities who have already done that, so there's examples to share. So if if you contact us, Jamie or I will send you some example language. Okay, here's another question. I'm going to read it. Um, let's see. You mentioned that exemptions and flavor ban ordinances, uh, like one for hookah, opens you up to litigation. What specific arguments would or has the industry used against such policies? I'll take that one. Um, the argument is both political and legal. So the political argument that we hear a lot is that that this puts the city council in the position of picking winners and losers but among businesses. And that has really resonated with the city council members. They don't want to be in that position. Um, and so they will often say they don't want to treat similar businesses um, differently. Um, legally, it can give rise to claims of um, equal protection violation or due process violation, depending on how the restriction is structured. And those wouldn't exist if all the retailers were treated the same. It doesn't mean that they will win. I don't mean to imply that it's a winning argument for the industry to make. But I think that it can compl complicate the arguments the city is making because you're advancing the policy to protect health, but exempting some businesses doesn't always make sense and isn't always consistent with that rationale. It can be, I mean, when you see the 500 feet of a school, that's a youth protection rationale um, or you know, density issues, but um, the cleaner policy in, in every way with the biggest benefit is one that does not exempt different kinds of retailers. Okay. Thank you. And um, I have one last question, I think, because we're near in the end of the hour. Um, adding to the compliance check conversation, this is difficult in small towns because once one store gets busted or one store gets suspicious, then they alert every other store. How can this be handled? I'll try that one. Although, Jamie, if you wanted to, I would defer. Um, I think that's a retailer education um, issue, um, as Jamie talked about, that's, an, that's a really important component of effective policy change is trying to work with the retailers. Um, I think that it's, you know, ex explaining the law, it's developing relationships that um, extend beyond the specific um, new policy. And um, I know some communities have sought to um, identify ways to help the retailers transition or to work with them sort of throughout the policy change process. So um, I think that um, there's good ideas sort of a best practices, but what that issue comes down to is that the retailers are not invested in and understanding the importance of the policy to the community. And so that's, that's sort of work that has to be done outside of the policy itself. Jamie, did you have more on that? Yeah. Oh, I just add that, I, that um... Certainly, there can be that possibility of, you know, sort of a race to the bottom where retailers are, are trying to warn each other. But I think uh, the there have been examples too of sort of a race to the top where the uh, retailers want to demonstrate that they are in full compliance, that they meet all their compliance checks, that they're good uh, citizens of the community. So I think there can be ways to sort of reward uh, or recognize, you know, retailers who have um, perfect records or are uh, doing well um, by their uh, not allowing youth usage. Okay. Well, thank you both very much. And thank you all for attending our webinar today. We will follow up with those of you uh, who sent us questions. We haven't been had time to respond. But uh, thank you all again, and have a good afternoon. Thank you.